Then let's talk about the cycle that uh, makes use of steam to generate the power. The base uh, thermodynamic cycle for such vapor power generation is called the Rankine cycle. And particularly, I'm going to talk about the ideal Rankine cycle that makes the vapor power cycle. Right? Uh, like all other power uh, cycles that we have talked about until today, the ideal Rankine cycle also has four basic processes. Compression, heat addition, expansion, and heat rejection. So the basic four uh, processes are still the same as other power cycles, but because we are using a water and steam as a working fluid, then the components that makes up this cycle should be a little different. So I'm going to talk about the compression process. Because we also uh, still we have an ideal compression process, the compression process itself should be still isentropic even for the Rankine cycle. But because now we try to compress a water which is incompressible fluid, so instead of using a compressor, now we have to use a pump. And after the compression process, heat addition process for the Rankine cycle should be constant pressure heat addition process. Because still, like the gas turbine, the Brayton cycle, in the Rankine cycle, also water flows through components. So we have to consider each component as an open system. And if you really think about the work, uh, the fluid coming through the heat addition process in an open system, that basically should be a constant pressure heat addition process. Yes, so now in the Rankine cycle, the heat addition process is the constant pressure heat addition process. And where it happens is in a boiler, or in more general term, in a steam generator. Now after steam generator, now we still have an expansion process. And for the ideal expansion process, we assume this is uh, the isentropic expansion process. And it happens in a turbine. After turbine, the heat rejection process happens in a condenser. Now why do we need a condenser? Because we have to reject heat from a steam. And as a result of this heat rejection process, heat, uh, the, the steam should be condensed to water. Okay, so that is why we call that component as a condenser. And this heat rejection process, likewise heat addition process, should be in a constant pressure. So if you look at the uh, schematic diagram, as you see in the, the left-hand side, we need a pump to increase the pressure of water. And then this water comes to the boiler or heat uh, steam generator, and it gets heat addition process. And then as a result of heat, uh, result of heat addition, this water becomes a uh, steam. And that high pressure and high temperature steam flows into a turbine and expands to run the turbine and as a result we can produce a uh, certain work from the turbine and now steam that uh, exits a turbine goes to condenser and heat is rejected and as a result then a uh, steam is condensed to water and comes back to a pump now can you draw the ts diagram based on these four processes because we have to think about the phase change process from water to steam, we have to think about how it changes phase. And we have to think about the, uh, the, the saturation dome in the TS diagram. And also, we increase the power, uh, increase the pressure from, uh, what, uh, from the low pressure to high pressure. And from the high pressure to low pressure, we also have expansion process. So there must be two constant pressure lines. Now let's assume that uh, saturated liquid water comes to a pump before uh, and it gets pressurized. So we start at point one, which is in on the saturation liquid on the saturation dome curve. And now it does have pressure increase to two in a pump. And because we already assumed that this ideal uh, you know, you know, compression process, its line should be vertical in the TS diagram. And now from 2 to 3, there should be a constant pressure heat addition process. So it, it should follow the constant pressure curve until it gets to 
0.3. And from 3 to 4, we have expansion process in a turbine. Now, because we are talking about the isentropic ideal process, we should have vertical line that comes from 3 to 4. And, and in 4, as you see, that is still very close to the uh, saturation uh, vapor line. It doesn't need to be inside the saturation, uh, saturation dome, though. Sometimes, depending on your operation condition or design point, this 4 still can go outside the saturation dome to be still this, uh, uh, the superheated steam. But anyways, uh, you should have like a vertical line that is for the ideal condition. And from 4 to 1, we go through the constant pressure line and rejects heat in a condenser. And I really hope that you should be able to draw the TS diagram for the ideal ranking cycle by yourself. Okay? Now, if you look at this TS diagram, now we can see that from 1 to 2 in a pump process, pump needs certain work by consuming it. So there must be certain work in during the 1 to 2. And 2 to 3, we have heat input. And 3 to 4, turbine produces a certain amount of work. And from 4 to 1, there should be certain heat rejection from the cycle to the outside. Then, based on those uh, knowledge, we can calculate the net work produced by the ranking cycle by Q in minus Q out. Or, if we know the turbine work and pump work, we can calculate turbine work minus pump work to get the net amount of work. Then how can we present that net amount of work of the ranking cycle in a TS diagram? As we discussed earlier for many other cycles, the net amount of work can be expressed as the area surrounded by these four processes. Then the next question is that how can you do the thermodynamic analysis based on the knowledge that we have learned about you know of these four basic processes of the ideal ranking cycle? Now what you have to remember clearly is that still for each component of the ranking cycle it should be considered to be an open system. So what you have to do is to apply the first law of thermodynamics for an open system. And also we assume that this entire process is in the steady state condition. Okay? Then now also we ignore the kinetic energy and, and potential energy change of the working fluid inside each component. Then from the general equation of the first law of thermodynamics for an open system, now we can simplify that equation to this equation. Okay. And this equation is based on the unit of kilowatt. Okay. Or by dividing this equation with the mass flow rate, then we can also express same thumb, first law of thermodynamics equation with those terms. And this one is based on kilojoule per kilogram in the unit. So every term is per unit mass. Okay? Now what you have to do is that we have to apply this equation for each component to, to, to think about which term should be removed and which term should be survived to calculate either work or uh, heat okay, from this equation. So now let's talk about the first component, which is a pump. And in a pump, we can see that it should be adiabatic. So your Q should be equal to zero. So only what remains from the first law of thermodynamics equation is the work and enthalpy changes. Now let's let's consider WP as the pump work, okay, per unit mass, okay, or specific pump work, okay. So we need that much of pump work by consuming this uh, work to run the pump. Right? So by thinking about the sign uh, of this pump work and applying that into the first law of thermodynamics and by knowing that the inlet should be index 1 and outlet should be index 2, we finally can get the equation for the pump work as H2 minus H1. 
And from the TS diagram, we already assumed that your one starts from the saturated uh, saturate liquid point. You know, actually, it doesn't need to be start from that saturated liquid point, but many times you assume this way. Otherwise, I'm going to specify in either an example or, or exam problem. But if you assume that it starts from the saturated liquid line, then your H1 should be saturated liquid enthalpy at the inlet temperature of a pump. So we basically can use this one to calculate the pump work. Okay. Another condition we have to think about when we discuss the pump is we have to satisfy the isentropic process okay. or in general ideal pump case. Okay. And now let me introduce very important equation when you try to calculate the pump work, uh, ideal pump work now. Okay, so the pump work, either expressed in terms of H2 minus H1, also that can be calculated by multiplying the specific volume at 1 times P2 minus P1. And this equation is the valid equation for ideal pump work okay in other words this equation only can be used for the ideal case in other words isentropic case okay. now this v1 is also the saturated liquid specific volume at the inlet temperature now the question is that how where does that equation come from right so we Actually, we already learned about it. So please review the lecture note 20, where we discuss the reversible steady flow work. Okay? And I'm not going to talk about the all details because we already learned, but I strongly recommend you to go back to lecture note 20 to, uh, to remind yourself of what you learned at the time. But to make all stories short, the, the result equation about the reversible steady flow work is minus integration of specific volume times dp from 1 to 2 when we ignore the kinetic energy and pi, uh, potential energy. But now, when you try to use this equation for the pump work, we already know that uh, water is incompressible. So, if we apply the equation here for the incompressible fluid, then V is constant then this equation can be simplified to the next equation. And that is where we get the equation of the ideal pump work as V1 times P2 minus P1. Here, we have to be careful about removing the negative sign from this equation because this reversible work on default is assumed to be positive when the system does the work to the surroundings. But for a pump, pump consumes a work, so we should you know, change the negative sign to positive sign. Because again, WP is the amount of work that your pump consumes. I hope that makes sense to you. Okay. Now, even for the boiler and turbine and condenser, uh, we also can use the first law of thermodynamics for an open system. They already simplified on top. Now for boiler, we don't have any work, so we can calculate Q in the amount of heat input to the boiler or steam generator can be calculated by H3 minus H2. For turbine, we don't worry about any heat loss or heat gain, so your turbine work can be calculated by H3 minus H4. However, there is one more condition that we have to satisfy, which is that process should be isentropic process for an ideal case. For condenser, because we don't have any work involved, so Q out, the rejection amount of heat, is H4 minus H1. So, please take a look at all things. Only the pump is a slightly exception because we some many times we are going to use the ideal pump work by using V1 and P2 and P1. But other than that, in order to calculate the, either work or heat, for the thermodynamic analysis of the Rankine cycle, what you have to do is you have to calculate or you have to know the enthalpy value at each 
point from 1, 2, 3, and 4. So that should be our goal. And in order to calculate those enthalpies, then we sometimes use other conditions. Now, we, we talked about the ideal ranking cycle, but in reality, there are many loss factors that should affect the performance of the ranking cycle. Then now, what kind of factors should be considered to think about the realistic factors of the operation of vapor power plant? The first thing that we can think about is pressure drops. And as you saw in the slides, there are a bunch of pipelines and through the pipelines, then water flows and steam flows, and there must be a lot of fluid frictions. And due to this friction, pressure is supposed to drop. And that should be one realistic factor that we have to consider. And another thing that we have to think about is there must be certain heat loss from steam to the surroundings because steams are usually at a very high temperature. And even though we insulate those pipelines well, you know, it's not possible to completely block the heat transfer. So there must be certain heat loss. And one of the very important things that we have to consider is there are irreversibilities in the pump and the turbine. So we have to think about those irreversibilities. And there are other losses such as subcooling or leaking of steam or air and mechanical frictions and so on. So by considering those realistic factors or loss factors, we actually have to uh, modify the TS diagram from ideal condition to real condition. And that is what you can see from the right-hand side of the TS diagram. Now, let me little think a little more about the irreversibilities in a turbine uh, and pump. And in order to consider that irreversibilities, we have to consider to use isentropic efficiencies. Okay, and we already talked about isentropic efficiencies for gas turbines. Actually, the all different uh, definitions are remain the same. So, pump efficiency is still defined the same as the definition of the compressor efficiency, which is the isentropic pump work to the actual pump work. And now, because we already talked about how to calculate the isentropic pump work, we do as V1 times P2 minus P1. And actual pump work can be calculated by H2A minus H1. Here, H2A is the point where we go through the realistic compression process by increasing the entropy due to the entropy generation. For isentropic case, as you know, that should be vertical line. Same thing for the turbine efficiency. And turbine efficiency is defined as the actual turbine work to the isentropic turbine work. And that can be calculated as you know, all entropy differences for the actual case and the ideal case. The ideal case can be uh, expressed in terms of vertical line in the TS diagram. But for the actual process, then your process should follow this kind of in, uh, line where for A should have higher, bigger entropy than the entropy at 3 due to the entropy generation. So that is what you can see uh, in terms of actual processes of the, uh, the pump and a turbine. 